Good morning, ladies. Welcome to our last uh, session in our study of James. Um, as I said last week, it's been challenging, but it's been good. And so I know that we have moved fairly quickly through this study, uh, maybe and certainly more quickly than uh, my life group probably would have moved through it. Uh, just simply because we don't have time, uh, we don't have the opportunity to kind of give and take on that. But I'm, I'm pretty sure some of the other life groups might have spent more time in person on this. Um, but I just pray, ladies, that you'll use this as kind of a launching pad. If um, there are some things in James that you really need to go back and look at again, I pray that you will do that. Um, reach out to me with questions. I would love to sit down and even visit with you or sit on the front porch and, and talk through some of these things. Um, there are five chapters in James, and so you could um, read a chapter a day. I mean, yeah, a chapter a day, Monday through Friday uh, for a month, and you would have read through James four times. And so maybe that's something that you want to do just to kind of let the truths of James soak into your heart. Um, I've got a few resources to share with you. Um, the first one I'm going to share with you is a commentary, um, and it's called Be Mature, uh, and it's written by Warren Wiersbe. Now, this cover is an old cover. I've had it around for a while, and so the cover is updated, but Warren Wiersbe has a commentary on um, James that's really good, so you might want to check that out. And actually, um, he has a commentary on every book of the Bible, and when I'm going to study a book of the Bible, I'm always going to gather several commentaries, but a Wiersbe commentary is always one of those. Another book that I've been reading as we studied along uh, in James was this book by, uh, by Glenna Marshall. It's called Everyday Faithfulness. Um, it's not a book about James, but she quotes James so much. The subtitle is The Beauty of Ordinary Perseverance in a Demanding World, and it really drives home and makes really practical some of the principles that James talks about in his letter. And then some of you knew this one was coming, but uh, Jen Wilkin has a book called Women of the Word. Um, and any book of the Bible that you want to study, um, if you just say, I, I want, if, you're, if you say, I want to learn to study God's Word for myself, this is a really great starting Point. And she gives you very practical ways to take God's Word and study it for yourself. And she even has questions in here if you want to uh, do that along with other people. Um, she also has a study of James. Again, her name is Jen Wilkin. She has a study of James that's really good if you wanted another go at working through this in a study. So I wanted to share those out with you just because I really hope that this is not the end of your study of James, but that you will take it and um, make it your own and let the Lord speak directly to you. And I thank you for the opportunity to share some of the things that he has taught me along the way. So last time I'm going to tell you that James is the letter. And it's written to Jewish Christians full of instructions. Um, <clears throat> now, there are, there are lots of letters uh, in the New Testament, uh, you know, another word that we use to refer to a letter in the Bible is an epistle. There are lots of them. Most of them written by Paul, some of them written by John, some of them written by Peter. But James is a little distinct in the fact that he's um, kind of all business. You notice his greeting was very short. He gets right to the meat of the letter. We're also going to see that the end of the letter, you know, a lot of Paul's letters end with, I hope to see you soon. You know, your ministry has meant so much to me, grace and peace to you, and all these closing greetings. But we're not going to see that in James. He's giving them instructions right up to the very last verse. And so we're going to be looking at those. But I think it's important to know, you know, as a mom, I think about when I'm, leaving or I'm giving my final instructions to uh, the kids when they were at home, um, the last things out the door are usually things that I think are really important. So I think it's important for us to say, okay, what were the last 
things that James leaves with these Christians? What are the, what are the things that he wants them to remember? So I'm going to read it. We're going to be today in James chapter 5, verse 13, and we're going to look all the way at, to the end of the book. Now, I'm going to begin reading that, and I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll go back and um, delve into it. Again, we're in James 5, verse 13, all the way down through verse 20. Let me give you a lot of time to look that up. So I'm going to begin reading now. I guess you can pause me on the video, right? Okay, here we go. Is anyone among you suffering? Let them pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins." All right, ladies, I want us to look at that very first line in verse 13. And James does not mean to be funny here, but it's funny to me because the first thing he says in verse 13, he says, is, any among, is anyone among you suffering? And I think, haven't you been talking about suffering since chapter one? And you just did a whole section on being patient in suffering. I don't know, like it doesn't go to what he's saying, but to me, it's funny that he, that he begins that way. But that aside, there are some tricky things that we need to understand in this passage. Now, I think the overarching lesson that he wants them to understand, specifically in verses 13 through 18, is that we should be people of prayer. But I want us to look specifically at a few little things that might make it difficult for us to understand what James is saying or that maybe we have been taught or assumed that are not necessarily taught in this passage. And so we're kind of going to be looking at what they don't mean and what, what these words and phrases do mean. First thing I want to look at is in verse 14, he talks about oil. He said, if someone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the, in the name of the Lord. Now, there's lots of opinions and lots of ideas about what the oil is. Now, there is the um, opinion that, that the oil, let them anoint him with oil because it's medicinal. Um, in this culture, oil was something that would have been used for medicinal purposes. So that's one opinion. Uh, another opinion about this is that it's sacramental, that somehow the oil has healing properties. Now, ladies, I'm going to tell you now, that's not what this scripture is saying here because it's not consistent with the rest of the Bible. Remember that when we are going to base a theology or a doctrine, it has to be based on the whole of Scripture and not just one verse. Um, the ability to heal, either physically or spiritually, can only come from God. And so oil holds no power of its own. Um, and, and we can see kind of a, a parallel truth when we look at even the blood, the sacrificial blood in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, so blood in sacrifices in the Old Testament, um, it symbolized the taking away of sins, but it didn't have any power to take away sins. Only Jesus was gonna be able to do that. In the same way, this oil that he's talking about this oil does not have the power to heal. 
only God has that. And I think that leads us to where I'm going to tell you that I really feel like this passage is teaching, teaching is that this oil is symbolic. Because when we look at the whole of Scripture, we find that oil is referred to in anointing. Okay, and it's particularly in the Old Testament, we see an anointing with oil as being for someone who has been set apart for special attention from God. Okay, either for a task or for care. And an example that we have of that is David. In 1 Samuel 16, 13, it says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Understand that the oil was symbolic. It was a symbol to say God is setting apart David. In this chapter and in the way that oil is used, I really believe that what it's saying is to anoint him with oil, to say we are marking this person. This is a symbol that we are asking for special care from God on behalf of this person. Okay, so the next little phrase that I want us to look at is in verse 15. It says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, let's talk about what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean that if we pray with enough faith, a person will be healed. And I think that those that misinterpret, that interpret it or misinterpret it that way, they put a great burden on people who are in times of suffering when they communicate that somehow your lack of faith um, would keep a person from being healed. Um, that's a burden that God never means for His people. So what does it mean? It means when it says um, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, that means, ladies, a prayer of faith is a prayer that surrendered to God's will. God, this is what we are asking, but we're surren surrendered to your will. We acknowledge the fact that your ways are higher than ours, and uh, we acknowledge that you are sovereign in all of it. That's what a prayer of faith is. I think about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they said, our God is able to deliver us, but if not, we won't bow. That that's, it was faith on display. That faith in prayer is the same way to say, God, this is where our hearts are. These are the th things that we long for, but we trust you regardless of the outcome. And it says the prayer of faith, the prayer believing and surrendered to God will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And ladies, I think sometimes that we only consider healing when it happens on this side of heaven. But God's in the business of healing here and restoring there. Sometimes He gives a, a temporary healing, but sometimes the healing is ultimate and permanent in heaven. Another phrase that I want us to look at before we get into the meat of really what He's trying to teach here is it says in the next uh, line there in verse 15 it says if he has committed sins he will be forgiven okay again I'm going to start with this is not what it means this does not mean that all sickness is because of sin specifically now I want to back up just a little bit and say that in general Disease and sickness is ultimately due to sin, but it's because we live in a broken world. It began as far back as the garden. It was never God's plan for us to live with sickness and disease. So, so in that sense, all sin uh, or all sickness is res the result of sin. But all sickness in our lives is not because of personal sin. So it doesn't mean that. What it does mean when it says... Uh, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. What it means, guys, is that God can heal a person physically and God can heal a person spiritually. Okay, If, if the problem is a physical illness, we should pray about those. 
but we should also pray about spiritual diseases and illnesses and things that are destructive in our lives. And I think sometimes we are very quick to pray for physical needs, and but I, I think we need to look at our prayer list and even our prayer time and say, are we spending equal time on praying for the spiritual needs of people? Because God is in the business of spiritual healing. Um, then he says something else there, another phrase that we need to look at. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Okay. He is addressing here specific sins that we, when we have sinned against a brother or a sister, when, when we have sinned against someone, that's what he's addressing here. Um, some have in the past interpreted this as where it says confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that somehow we have to confess to someone, even in certain uh, religious traditions that we need to confess to a priest. Martin Luther, uh, you know, the leader of the Reformation. One thing that he said about this verse, he said, that's an interesting name for a priest, one another. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying confess your sins. When we have wronged another person, that we should be ready to confess those sins and to receive forgiveness from them and from the Lord and receive that spiritual healing. This is not a call for a public confession of sin. Ladies, a principle that you might just take into your heart to remember, the extent of your sin should be the extent of your confession. So if, if your sin is a personal sin, then that confession should happen between you and God. If, if your sin was between you and another brother or sister in Christ, then it should be between you and that other brother and sister in Christ. If it was on a bigger scale, then it should be, then your confession should be on a larger scale. But guys, what this is saying here is not calling for public confession of sin or confession of sin, uh, of personal sin. It's saying, keep your hearts clean between each other. Um, keep things right uh, and confess your sins, pray for each other, practice forgiveness and receive forgiveness from the Lord. So, I hope that going just through those phrases like that hasn't disjointed our passage too much, but I, I kind of want us to know what he's talking about in those key verses. But now I want us to look at what's, what's he trying to teach here? What is he trying to say to these Christians? He is charging them. He's spurring them on. He's saying, look to the Lord, pray. So, what do we learn about prayer in these verses? The first thing that we learn is that we should always be praying. Prayer, prayer should be habitual in the life of a Christ follower. And that's where he begins. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Pray. Are you cheerful? Sing praise. Are you sick? Call someone to pray with you. And so one, one of the points that he is making here is that prayer should be habitual in the life of a Christian. The other thing that we see is that prayer should be corporate. We should pray together um, where he says, let him call for the elders of the church. Now the context here lends this to maybe someone who is too sick to even gather with believers. Someone that can't get to, to where they are with other believers. It says, let him call other, other believers and the elders together to pray for him. We should be praying together. Um, I even think sometimes that this is important. Um, if this person is too sick to pray for themselves, um, I think sometimes we can be so burdened and so overwhelmed by suffering and situations that we cannot even pray for ourselves, and that's when we need the body. And this just became so real to me um, just a few years ago, and I've, I mentioned it in a few sessions back when, when Jay uh, suffered an aortic dissection and when he had his emergency heart surgery. And that day, hope looked very dim. Uh, 
um, that God was going to heal Jay um, this side of heaven. And I remember listening to the doctors and sitting in a room and hearing all the scenarios that might play out. And I knew that I should pray, but I was so overwhelmed and truthfully so frightened that I, could, I couldn't pray. But this is what I know, ladies. Some of you were. You were praying. And ladies, I think in that situation right there, I realized we've got to pray for each other, especially when we hear that a sister in Christ is suffering because she may not be able to gather herself enough to pray. And that's when we stand in the gap for that sister or for that brother. So we should pray together. We should pray always. We should pray for each other. And then it gets down to um, verse uh, 16. And he says, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as, as it is working. He reminds us there is power in prayer, not because of the words we say or our position, but because of the God that we are praying to. Um, but what he's saying is he's saying, pray in spite of yourself. Because in verse seven, 17, he says, Elijah was, an, was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Ladies, I really think, you know, we've, we've talked about before when I've looked at these verses, and I, I believe I've shared it even in this study, that verse 16 was a really foundational verse for me. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. But he goes on there and he says, hey, Elijah, I think we focus on the fact that uh, it didn't rain for three years, and then he prayed and then it did, and look at that power. But I think James wants us to see in verse 17, it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Guys, the effectiveness of, of prayer is not based on who we are or where we are spiritually or any of that. It's based on who God is. And so we should pray in spite of ourselves. The overriding instruction, and I think I've, I've said this, is that James wants them to understand is that we should pray. We should just pray. Now, I wonder what are the things that keep us from praying? If we're not women of prayer, why not? Well, maybe it's a decision. Maybe it's, it's an example where we're saying, We've got a plan. We know what we're going to do tomorrow, how long we're going to stay there. And we don't let God's plans override ours. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's, it's a decision and it's, and it's a sin. But maybe we feel like we don't know how to pray. Maybe you're a new Christian or maybe someone's never kind of walked you through that. And I don't think that that's something um, that's uncommon or that something to be embarrassed about, because we know in the New Testament that the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so I think that's a process uh, that we can learn how to pray. So if we're going to become women of prayer, how are we going to do that? Number one, talk to God. Pray. Make it a habit. If it's been something you haven't made time for, make time for it. And say, I'm going to spend time each day in prayer and then ask God to teach you to pray that's a prayer that he'll honor and that he, he wants to feel and he wants to grow you in that way now I also want to share a few resources with you today must be resource day but I want to share a few resources with you on prayer if, if you say you know that's something that I would like to learn more about I want to dig in deeper as far as being able to communicate with God in a, in a way that I can. Now, let me just qualify this by saying, you and the Holy Spirit, you have everything you need to, to talk to God. But here are some resources if you want to dig in deeper in study. Um, Kay Arthur has a study called Lord Teach Me to Pray. It's, it's a great study and it's based on 
the what we call um, um, the Lord's Prayer that Jesus prayed when he um, showed the disciples how to pray. So that's it's a really good study. Um, if I was going to suggest one book on learning about prayer, it would be a b- book called Praying the Bible uh, by Don Whitney. Um, and it's a very practical and um, anyway, it's just a good one. So that's Praying the Bible. Um, and so those are a couple of resources that you might want to look into. Uh, a man named Ian Bounds has written several books on prayer. They're older books, and so the language is going to sound older to you, but those are really good on prayer too. So anyway, those are some things that maybe you could look to if you want to explore that your prayer life and grow your prayer life even more. Okay, so now, so he's told them to look to the Lord. And that brings us to the last two verses in James. Verse 19 through 20. And I'm going to read them again because it's been a few minutes since we read these. He says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So he ends his letter with this reminder that not only do we need to look to the Lord, but that we need to look after each other. And I think it's it's very fatherly and even motherly maybe that this is where he ends because he looks at someone who wanders from the faith. Now, again, let's qualify what he's not saying here. He's not saying someone who has been saved and now is no longer saved. They've walked away from the faith and somehow they have lost their salvation. Okay, that's not a biblical principle. So it can't mean that. So let's look at what it does mean. In verse 19, he says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. What he's talking about is a phrase that we like to use where we call a backslidden Christian. We call We say, this is a backslidden Christian. They've wandered from what all that they could have in Christ. Another way that we could say, we could say backslidden Christian, or we could say just a Christian who is in sin. But ladies, the same principle here applies to someone who's lost and has never received uh, salvation. When we bring those people back, either a brother who has wandered from the truth brother or sister who has wandered from the truth. When we bring them back or when we share the gospel with someone who's never heard it, when we restore them to faith, either by rebuke, encouragement, care, whatever form that takes, we are actually partnering with God. Okay, now I want you to see something. He says, If anyone among you wanders and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Does that mean that if I encourage a brother back into his relationship with the Lord, into growth and back on the path of following Christ, does that mean that I have saved his soul from death? No. What it does mean is that I can actually partner with God in the life of a brother or a sister. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, In Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. See, God not only saves us, but He sustains us. He not only sets us apart and, and uh, for, His, for His salvation, But He continues that act of setting us apart and of making us into who we should be. And when we wander and we need to be brought brought back in, guys, that's just as much a work of God as our salvation, as our initial salvation was. And so that act of sustaining us, when we see a brother who is strayed and we bring him back into the fold, ladies, We are partnering with God in His His 
leading and his guiding of that person. We're, we actually get to be a part of what God has done. Now, this is true whether we're talking about a saved person who has wandered or whether we're talking about someone who has never been saved before. We get to partner with God. The, the power to save, the power to restore is not in us. But we do get to be a part of it. Now, uh, a little girl one time said to a counselor, she, she was saved at Vacation Bible School, and she looked at the counselor and she said, thank you for saving me. Now, she'll grow in her salvation, and someday she'll understand that it's not that counselor that saved her, that it's God who saved her. But I think she's kind of echoing what James says here. Now, not only do we partner with God in His sustaining, but we partner with God in His covering. And that's what it says there. It says, we'll save His soul from death and we'll cover a multitude of sins. And I wonder, ladies, when we find that a brother or a sister has wandered from the truth, do we seek to cover it, to bathe it in God's forgiveness, or do we seek to expose it? Do we talk about it to others, or do we seek to bring that person back in? I think what James is talking about here as far as restoring a brother or a sister to the ways of the Lord can be summed up in a C.S. Lewis quote. It says, A friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and can sing it back to you when you have forgotten the words. Ladies, we need each other. And so he reminds them, look to the Lord, yes, in prayer, but also look after each other. And that brings us to the end of James. So let's talk about just a few takeaways that we have from this study. James writes to relatively young believers in unprecedented times. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to us? Our major takeaway should relate back to James 2.26, which I told you when we first read it, that it was really the theme of what James was trying to teach. James 2, 26 says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. If we were going to sum up what James is saying in this book, we could sum it up this way. If our lives have been changed by Christ, it should be obvious to the world around us. It should be obvious in the decisions we make, in the plans that we make, in the words that we say, in the relationships that we have. It should be obvious. And if it's not obvious, why not? Why not? And so, ladies, I think when we, as we finish James, it brings us to a point to where we have to, we have to do business with God. If our, if our lives have not been changed, Maybe, maybe, ladies, it's because you never surrendered to what Christ has done on the cross for you. Maybe it's because admitting your own helplessness is, difficulty, is difficult and you would rather just work really hard to try to be everything, to try to live up to God's standard. But I know this, ladies, that if that has been your pursuit, to be good enough to earn God's favor, that you're not reaching it. You're not getting there, and it's frustrating and overwhelming. But I have good news for you. You can stop trying because Christ died on the cross so that we could be reconciled to God because the truth is we can never live up to God's standard. But Christ died in our place so that we can live in relationship to the Father. And when we surrender to what Christ has done on the cross for us, he changes us and He puts His Spirit and lives within us and gives us the power to live the life that's consistent with who we are in Him. That's good news, ladies. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I pray that you would contact. If you'll contact the church, they'll get you in contact with me. and I'd love to talk to you about this further. But ladies, I also know that for some of us, Maybe there's not fruit. We said at the beginning that James was going to be a growth chart to kind of look at 
um, our relationship with the Lord and say, are we growing in a way that's healthy in Him? And maybe you've looked at this growth chart and you said, you know what? I'm not growing. I'm not developing in, in the Lord like I should. And that's where you need to do business with God. Have you become distracted by trials, by disagreements, by prejudices, by sin? To look through James and say, okay, Lord, what business do I need to do with you? What repentance needs to happen in my life for me to move forward? Lean in and do business with God. Be a hearer, yes, but be a doer too. Because remember, as we talked about a few weeks ago, He gives more grace and His power is beyond any and all that you have on your own. Ladies, we, like the people to whom James was written, we're a scattered people right now. I long for the day when we gather again in church. But the scattering that took place in the first century was a vehicle for the gospel going into all the world. The fact that Christians were spread out meant that the word and what Jesus had done went, also went out into all of the world. Let's do the same. As scattered people, let's lean in. Let's do business with God. Let's be where we need to be in position to Him so that the gospel will shine through our lives and into the world around us. Thank you for joining me in this study, ladies, and let's pray. Oh God, thank you for this book. Thank you for your word that you have given to us that teaches us your plan, your will, and gives us guidance and comfort and peace. God, I just pray that you would take the lessons that we've learned today. God, I pray that you would burn it on our hearts, Lord, that we would um, be willing to sit face to face with you, Lord, and do business with you. God, I pray that because of our time in your word, that your gospel will go out into the world, that people will come to know you and that you would be glorified. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.